to the Dowey Talks Expert Series. My guest today is Dan Miller. Dan is a longtime practitioner and teacher of the internal martial arts. He is also the author or co-author of some modern classics on the subject, including Pagwa Jong Fun Fundamentals Volumes 1 and 2 with Park Bok Nam, and Shingi Nagong Shingi Health Maintenance and Internal Strength Development with Tim Cartmel. Dan is also known for being the founder and publisher of the Bagua Zhang Journal, which ran from 1993 to 1997 and is widely regarded as being one of the best martial arts publications of the English language. Dan, good morning. Hey, how are you doing? Good. Uh, I just wanted to say real quick at the outset, you know, that when we first started this podcast, uh, two of the first people I interviewed, the first two people I interviewed were Ken Fish and Tim Cartmel. Yeah. And both of those guys were like, you know, you need to talk to Dan. <laughs> and uh, um, I, I said, yeah, I would love to talk to Dan. And, and then uh, when I went uh, looking for you, I actually found that you had, uh, I think at one point, been living in the city that I live in, Lexington, Kentucky. So did, did, were you here for a while? Is that No, that... I never lived there. Huh? Okay, maybe, maybe I mean, I've, I've been there, been there a bunch, but I never lived there. Maybe that's what it is. I know yeah. you've got the bluegrass music connection. So I was pretty pleased and surprised to find that out. But anyway, yeah. thank you. Thanks to Tim and Ken for the for the tip. But um, so I generally what I ask everybody at the outset is how how they, how did you get involved in martial arts to begin with? Yeah, well, um, it came together later for me than some of the other folks you've interviewed. Um, my my parents were real big into sports. You know, my dad was a basketball coach and a baseball coach, and my mom was a swim team coach, and so. Growing up, that's what I did. You know, every season I was involved in a different sport. I did football and basketball and baseball and swimming and diving and um, soccer and just, you know, we were, our family is just always involved in all kinds of sports. And and so I did that uh, all the way up until high school. And my freshman year of high school, I played basketball. And then in the spring, I wasn't going to go out for baseball because I just wanted um, basketball is my best sport and I wanted to focus on that and I'd I'd gone to basketball camp every year as a kid and the camp the guy who ran the camp wanted to hire me as a camp junior counselor after my freshman year of high school and I just wanted to you know practice and get ready for that and my dad said well you're not going to sit around here all spring you're going to do something and my friend was going out for um, the track team as a distance runner. I said, well, you know, I'll do that. That'll be good. Build my endurance. You know, and it turned out that that was my best thing. You know, I I, I ended up being a good long distance runner and uh, did that all through high school, you know, cross country, winter, indoor track and outdoor track. Um, got recruited by a number of colleges and ended up going to the United States Naval Academy uh, and ran track and cross country there. Um, and then a couple things happened in college, like before every, every summer when you're at the Naval Academy, you do, you go on, uh, you go out and sort of do internships on Navy ships or whatever. Um, and I, when you graduate from the Na Naval Academy, you can go into the, choose to go into the Navy or the Marine Corps because the Marine Corps is under the Department of the Navy. And I knew I wanted to be in the Marine Corps and so I went on what's called a Marine Corps option cruise uh, before my senior year of college. And I was on a ship going from San Diego to Kaneohe Bay, Hawaii. And we were going to train for four weeks with the Marines on Kaneohe Bay. When I was on that ship for a week during the transport, I really had nothing to do. And there's a platoon of UDT SEALs that were on the ship. And I loved working out. And they worked. that's all they did. Uh, on the ship because they were just along for the ride as well. So I worked out with those guys every day and they would do all kinds of physical calisthenic stuff. And then they'd start to work on hand-to-hand -hand combat stuff. And I got kind of, oh, that's kind of cool. That's kind of interesting. I kind of did that with them for a little bit. And then when I got to uh, Kaneohe Bay, I, I spent um, about two weeks with Force uh, Recon Marines and we did an amphibious landing on an island called Koalawe uh, in there. And, and just, I, I started to think about, you know, uh, my life is going to be, you know, trying to save my life, you know, trying to, you know, I'm going to war. Right. Probably. right. And so maybe I need to learn uh, some of this stuff. Some of this martial arts stuff may help me save my life and live the life of others, you know. So that was just a seed planted in my brain, but I was still involved in running. Um, 
and then you know you, you guys do this Dallas podcast when I was uh my first semester of my senior year in college I took a class called philosophy of religion and one of the exercises or papers we had to write was just to write down what our spiritual or religious ideas were like if we were if we had a, our own religion what would that be like you know and I wrote this paper and uh, I got my paper back from the professor and and big red pen at the top he says you need to look into Taoism you know because I guess what I had the things I had said were where I thought were my personal I, I'd never heard of Taoism but I guess they aligned with uh, Taoist thought what just what my personal feelings were so that kind of put that seed in my brain too then during my senior year of college, I got stress fractures in my shins from the from the running. I was overtraining, and uh, I graduated college and really uh, I, still having trouble with that. I got into long distance biking because you know I really missed. I don't know if you call it you know whatever you call it, but that zone you get into when you're, yeah. you know, doing a physical activity, and you just get in that zone. You know, especially with a long distance endurance thing. So, I was trying to. Um, replicate that with the biking but I it just didn't feel the same to me and so I thought uh you know maybe I'll get into meditation I found a meditation teacher you know from the you know East Indian tradition uh and I liked that but it was just a seated meditation and my biking partner I was telling him one day I said man I'm not getting the same groove from the spiking that I got with running and the seated meditation I'm really enjoying but I'm used, I'm used, I've been an athlete my whole life. I'm used to involving my body, you know? Yeah. And so he goes, Oh, you ever heard of Qigong or Taiji? And I'm like, what's that? You know? And so that was my introduction to that in about, I don't know, in about 1983. So I started uh, exploring that through books and things. My buddy had learned, he was teaching me stuff, but then, you know, I was in the military. I stayed in the Marine Corps for 10 years and um, I was stationed somewhere new every two to three years. And what I would do is wherever I was stationed, I would find the best internal arts guy and I'd ask him, what's your best thing? Mm -hmm. And so then I, you know, that's why I ended up studying Taiji, Shingi and Bagua during that 10 year period, just because, you know, I, you know, when I went to, I was stationed in Virginia and Ken Fish was there. And I said, man, what's your best thing? He said, Shingy. I said, okay, I'll study Shingy with you. You know, that's that's the kind of way I did it for the, the, the years I was in the Marine Corps. So that's kind of how it came together. So uh, at what point, what, what was your first Tai Chi? Was it Yang style Tai Chi? Yeah, Yang style Tai Chi uh, was my first uh, Tai Chi. And I, you know, I studied that with several different people and then um, again, when I was in Virginia um, in the late '80s, I studied uh, the uh, Yang style, the, the 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 long 108 Yang style yeah. with Christopher Pei. And Christopher <laughs> Pei had um, studied with Yang Zhendo, you know, in in Beijing, and um, so I learned that form from him. And then he brought over Yang Zhendo and Yang Jun you know, to the United States and I studied some stuff with them. And then uh, my first trip to China was with Christopher Pei. We did a Tai Chi, sort of a, like a Tai Chi tour of China. And again, studied with Yang Zhendo in Beijing. So that that's the Yang style I still teach today is the 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 long Yang 108 from, from Yang Zhendo and Yang Jun. The whole trip, we were in China, I don't know, for that trip is 1991. And we were there for three or four weeks and Yang Jun traveled the whole tour with us we went to Chen village and Shaolin temple and you know we went all over the we went to the great wall and you know studied uh Chen style and Yang style and Wu style it was just like a Taiji trip to China and uh and Yang Jun was along the whole time with us and uh we went study with Fu Zhongwen in in Shanghai and with Yang Zhendu in Beijing and the different Chen style guys in Chen village so it was it was awesome uh, yeah for great. China was your um given that you had the military background and your sort of the first uh, interest in it was sort of a combat related interest were your early yang style teachers did they show you a lot of the, the fighting applications of the movements yeah yeah um some of them were 
more into the fighting thing. Uh, Christopher Pay was, was was more uh, form and competition, you know, not that much fighting. But some of the guys I studied with before that were were showing applications, and we do so like freestyle fighting. And I get together with other guys, you know, that were in the classes that were interested in that. We get together and mix it up and things like that. So after that initial trip to China, when was the next time that you went back? Well, see, I started the Bagua Journal in 1990. Um, there was a uh, Bagua Teachers Conference that was organized and planned during a uh, martial arts tournament in Houston, Texas. And all these guys were there that taught Bagua from around the country. I don't know, you know, 15, 20 guys. Um, and so I, I had been publishing some things uh, for, you know, in the Marine Corps, I just just not part of my job, but like when I was in graduate school, uh, the Marine Corps sent me to graduate school at the uh, Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. And while I was there, I was like the editor of the computer club newsletter. I mean, so I, 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 I had a computer, I knew how to do some publishing stuff. So I thought, you know, it'd be cool to start something that focused on Bagua to try to, you know, put out more information and propagate the art. Um, and so in 1990, I went to this instructor's conference and I said, hey, you know, I'm interested in putting this out. Would you guys be willing to support me uh, with articles and interviews and stuff? And they're all for it. All of them were like, yeah, yeah, let's do it, you know. And so that was 1990. So I was already doing that uh, in its infancy when I went to my first trip to China. And then Christopher Pei, of course, knew that. And his wife uh, had been on the the Beijing Wushu team, I think Jet Li was actually a, a, a teammate of hers. And so she knew a lot of people. And so she uh, was very helpful in introducing me to some very important Bagua people in Beijing during that first trip. I I, I, I met Sun Lutong's daughter, Sun Jin Yun, for the first time. I, I met and interviewed Li Ziming. I met uh, Sun Zhu Jun, you know, all, who grew up in the Chen Chung family village, you know, I met uh, some important people. And then also, I had already done a phone interview with Liu Xinghan. Um, and so I knew he practiced in the Temple of Heaven Park. And so I walked around the park one morning with a copy of the Bagua Journal that he was in. And I found him and I showed it to him, you know, and, uh, and so I started studying with him. I studied with him every trip I went to China from that first first meeting. So he he knew who I was because uh, we had, had had the phone interview. He had a student named Zhang Jie that was living in Seattle and I did the interview through through him over the phone. So yeah, that's that's kind of how uh okay, so your your question was what was my next trip to China? So my first trip was in 1991. And in August of 1992 I I I left the Marine Corps after 10 years, I decided uh, that I wanted to start this martial arts publishing company. I've been doing the Bagua Journal for a little while. And a lot of people were asking me saying, hey, you know, why don't you do some books? You know, we like what we're doing. It's newsletter or journal. Why don't you do some books? And so I thought, yeah, I would like to do that. So I got out of the Marine Corps and uh, went to China again. I went to Taiwan, Hong Kong, and mainland China during that trip. And that's when I met Bill Tucker and Tim Cartmel and those guys in, in Taiwan. Uh, there was a guy uh, um, that I had met, uh, Kent Howard. You may be familiar with Kent. Uh, I had just met him through letters that he had sent me after seeing the Bagua Journal. He'd sent me some letters about his teacher and what he was doing in Taiwan. So before my first trip to Taiwan, which was in September of 1992, I, I wrote Kent a letter and said, hey, I'm coming to Taiwan. Could you be my translator? And he said, um, well, I'm not going to be here during that period of time, but I got this friend, Bill Tucker. And he said, he'll do it for you. And, and then I, I had said that after I go to Taiwan, I'm going to go to Hong Kong and then to mainland China. Can, can you travel with me? And then he said, you know, he said, well, Bill Tucker will translate for you in Taiwan, but he can't go the rest of the trip with you. But his friend Tim Cartmel will do it, you know. So that's how I met Bill and Tim, my first trip to Taiwan. Those guys were living there. And then we all just became really good friends. And every trip I went to China after that, either Bill or Tim or both of them went 
with me. And I always usually went to Taiwan first. Uh, sometimes then Hong Kong and then the mainland China. That's, I, you know, I did that trip, you know, twice a year for a number of years. Yeah. When I was talking to Tim, he said that uh, because you had the publication and it was already, it became well known quickly within martial arts circles in China. He said that it was a, almost like a magical access because when, when you track somebody down and interview them, they knew they were like, yeah, come, come, come as fast as you can because they wanted, they wanted to be in the magazine. Yeah, it was very, uh, uh, I was very fortunate that way, because as you know, sometimes access to these teachers is very difficult. And even if you get access, you know, you're just a beginning student, they're not going to just sit and talk with you, you know, mm -hmm. but because they all were interested in being highlighted in the magazine. And I, I think that the reason was because they knew that the youth in Taiwan and China and Hong Kong just weren't interested in this stuff. <clears throat> and they they had spent their lives doing it. They wanted to see it, you know, continue. And they thought, well, if Americans are interested in it, maybe this is a way that it will continue. And so maybe I need to talk to these guys. And uh, so we were very fortunate that way. And then we got a lot of, once we met some people, we got a lot of introductions. Like, uh, you you talked to Tim about Liang Kequn. Yeah, Liang Kequn, um, I met him on my first trip to China because he was friends with Liu Xinghan, uh, and Liu Xinghan introduced me to to Liang Kequn. And uh, every time we went over, Liang Kequn would just take us around to his his martial arts buddies, you know. And then um, the first trip back to China in 1993 was in the spring of '93, and Vince Black and I went together. And Vince had been to China in 1989 and met a bunch of people. And so, you know, we made connections through the people Vince knew. And everybody that we met would sometimes say, hey, you know, why don't you, inter why don't you interview my, my friend, you know? And, and so we just kind of made those connections and met people that way. It, yeah, I was very fortunate that we got to sit with these guys and they would pretty much answer any question that we had. And the cool thing was also, you know, I was traveling with Vince Black, Tim Cartmel, Bill Tucker, Tom Bizio. The guys that were with me were all very, very good martial artists, you yeah. know. And so we'd interview these guys and then we'd go out to dinner and hang out at the hotel and sit and talk about all this stuff. You know, it was a very rich uh, environment for learning about all this stuff that was going on. And, uh, you know, it was very interesting to see the differences in, in, in Taiwan and Hong Kong and what it was like still in mainland China. And it, it was all, you know, it's very, very fascinating. Yeah. That's amazing. That's an amazing opportunity. So well, at this time period, when you were publishing the journal, who was your main Bagua teacher? Or did oh, you? I had, a, I had a number of them. Like I said, you know, I moved around. Um, I moved around a lot. So everywhere I went, I studied with somebody a little bit different and some, some better than others. Some I won't mention because, <laughs> you know, they just weren't very good. And, and I didn't know it at the time, but later I like, oh man, I, I got to relearn all this because that guy just really didn't know what he was doing. Um, but like when my last tour of duty in the Marine Corps was in, uh, out of the Pentagon, uh, Washington DC area. And so I was taking, I was, I was studying Xingyi with Ken Fish. And at the same time I was studying Bagua with Park Buknam because he was in Virginia. <laughs> and then I was studying Taiji from, uh, uh, Christopher Pay because he was in Virginia. I did two days a week with Ken and two days a week with Chris Pay, and then and, and then every Saturday with Park Bucknam. So, you know, that's how that book, those two books, came about uh, with Park because I was studying with him. And then in 1992, I moved uh, to California, and um, you know, we were just continuing to do the journal. I was continuing to, to travel to China, and I, I met, I had met Vince Black in uh 1992 um in the summer of 1992 and we hit it off we 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 became real fast friends and so i started studying Xingyi with vince and then uh you know he was doing the yangs and poo bagua with leeds amin and so we every time we went to china we met with uh uh leeds amin had passed away uh, after the first time i interviewed him shortly after the first time i interviewed leeds amin he passed away so we were studying with Leeds and Ming's guys 
uh, when, every time we went to China. So, and then I was studying the the Cheng style with Liu Xing Han every time I went to China. We first thing we do when we were in Beijing was go go to Liu Xing Han's area in Temple of Heaven Park and practice with him, and then get on with the rest of the day after that. And we did Xing Yi with Liang Kachuan. We did a lot of Xing Yi with Liang Kachuan. So, um, and actually, what I teach now. Uh, just because I, I, just because I, you know, every time I went to Beijing, I met with uh, Sun Lutong's daughter, Sun Junyun, because she was, as Tim told you, she was phenomenal. I mean, she was just the nicest person you'd ever want to know in your life, you know, just very open, didn't say a bad word about anybody else. She was just very pleasant human. And uh, she asked me and Tim both, she's like, can you, can you, you know, keep my father's martial arts alive, you know, can you help us do that? And so, um, so that's what I teach now when I teach Bagua, it's predominantly Sun, Sun's Bagua, because it's very, it's very straightforward, very direct, you know, it's, it's not real flowery and complicated. And, you know, it's, it, it, and, and Tim, I have Tim come here, I live in Missouri, and Tim comes here about once a year. And, uh, we do either Sun style Taiji or Sun Bagua. And uh, I do Liang Kachuan Xing Yi because it's very similar, you know, to, to what Sun, Sun did. You know, I think that uh, Liang Kachuan studied with uh, Chen Tinghua's son. Um, and Chen Tinghua's son, I believe, studied Bagua, I mean, studied Xing Yi with Sun Lutang. So I think the, the Xing Yi that Liang Kachuan did was very close to what uh, Sun Lutong did, although neither Tim or I studied uh, Xing Yi with uh, Sun Jin Yun. Tim studied the, uh, Tim stayed in Beijing longer than I did. Uh, when I went back home, a lot of times he'd stay there and he went on other trips to study with Sun Jin Yun. When I met with Sun Jin Yun, every time it was just interview, We I just asked her all about her dad. We did the we did the Xing Yi Chuan Chui book, you know, so I interviewed her extensively for that. And uh, so I learned Sun Taiji and Sun Bagua from Tim uh, after he got it from Sun Jin Yun. Um, so anyway, that that's that's what I do now is I teach Yang style Taiji, Sun style Taiji, uh, predominantly Sun Bagua. Although you know I mix in other things, you know, um, mostly exercises, but the form we do is pretty much Sun. Uh, but also we 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 expand that and. Do improvise. I, I think Bagua is like the improvis improvisational jazz of martial arts, you know. Um, and so I have other, you know, to me, single palm change is not a technique, it's a principle. And so, and so like double palm, everything in Bagua to me is based on single palm change, double palm change, circle walking, and the eight mother palms, you know. Everything is is a is a variation of those things. And so I teach single palm change and double palm change as a principle, not a not a specific choreography or specific technique. And so we learn a lot of variations uh, from those things and, and combinations of those things. And I think that talking to Sun Jin Yun, uh, Sun's Bagua, he, he had this specific form, you know, had the single palm change, the double palm change, and the eight guas, right? But then he, after that, he wanted his students to combine all that in a lot of various ways and sort of improvise a freestyle uh, form. And that's that's kind of what I want. I like to have my students do. And Park Bok Nam was that, that way too. He would teach you forms and he would teach you applications. But when you had a test, he didn't want to see anything he ever showed you. He didn't want you to just copy and regurgitate. He wants you to think about the principles and come up with a form that you invented and applications that you invented to, to see if you understand the principles of Bagua and not just the choreography of some form you may have learned. So I kind of approach it that way too. Yeah, I, one of the things that really stood out to me about the book that you did with uh, Park Bok Nam was the, um, I'm going to mess this person's name up, but Xiao Young, I think the the um, hexagrams, the square inside the circle, yeah. you mentioned you related that to um, binary numbers and 
uh, you know, in computer programming and how these 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 limited number of things actually can can become an unlimited number of things. And yeah, yeah talk, exactly. You know, the improvisation aspect of Bagua that really stood out to me. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's the way I like to teach it. Is is a is it not a technique based art, but a principle based art? If you have the the alignments and the mechanics, you know. Um, any move can be Bagua. And I think that's that's where people get into this idea. When I did the Bagua journal, you know, people would write me and say, is Bagua only palm strikes? Is Bagua only circle walking? It's like, well, you know, if you think about it, do you, if a country's going to go to war, do they say, uh, well, you know, we're not going to have an air force because that's not part of our style. You know, I mean, you use everything you got. Bagua's got fist punching, Bagua's got straight line stuff. If it works, you use it, but in the context of certain alignments and mechanics and, you know, uh, energy and, and and all the all the things that we relate to internal martial arts, using the opponent's force against them, not pushing force against force. If you, if, if it's, it adheres to all those principles, it can be Bagua, you know. Same with Shingi or Taiji. Shingi has circle walking footwork. Bagua has straight line footwork. Shingi has palms. Bagua has fists. I mean, they all have everything. It's just a matter of where they start and what they emphasize at first. And then they go into other things later, you know. But it's to me, it's all the same. And it, when, when I was studying Taiji with uh, Fu Zongwen in Shanghai, he said, you know, when I was a kid, Taiji was just Taiji. We didn't talk about this style or that style or 42 or 24 or whatever. It was just it was just all Taiji, you know. So I think people get uh, too focused on categorizing things, you know. Yeah, I think a lot of that nowadays is a marketing based too. Everybody's trying to have a niche or whatever. They want to sell something. So Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's that's another problem. Yeah. So going back just a little bit, I, you know, talking to Tim about Leon Kachwin, mm -hmm. a really amazing person. Um, when you studied Shingy with him, was it different in any way than the Shingy that you you trained in before? Was there something uh, that any light bulbs come on in your brain when you were tra training with him? Yeah, I mean, there, there's always, uh, you know, slight variation. I mean, you do the five elements and there's, there's always variations, but the, the, the really thing that came that light bulb moment for me with Leon Kachuan is because, you know, as Tim told you, Leon can, Leon spent 30 years in prison, 15 years as a prisoner and 15 years as it like a janitor at the same oh. prison. Yeah. And he just practiced Xing Yi the whole time. Yeah. He told me uh, during the famine years in China, of course, you know, the prisoners weren't the first people to get food, you know, yeah. and he said that in the morning, they made the prisoners stand with their ankles and knees together. And if the guard could put his fist through the space between the person's thigh bones, that person got no more food Yeah, because they just figured he was going to die. And he was working out every day and the other prisoners said, you're crazy. You're going to, you know, lose weight, you know, but his muscle tone stayed because of his practice that he, you know, he never, the guard was never able to put his fist through the, through the space in his thighs. And, uh, you know, he, he figured it saved his life because he practiced so hard when he was in prison. But, and then after he got out of prison, he traveled around Shangxi province, uh, Hebei province and, and met with other Xingyi people. You know, he'd studied with a number of different Xingyi people as, as he was growing up. But then as he got older out of out of prison, you know, he met with others and traded and and talked about it and explored it. And he had a, a huge uh, library of books that he had he had borrowed books from anybody that had books and he hand hand copied them. Uh, he had all these books that he had hand copied. So any anyway, the cool thing about him is he had. Six or eight versions of every one of the five elements that he would teach and different footwork that went with each one of them. You know, it wasn't just the typical uh, peach one that you might see. He would do it with with a, a zigzag footwork or, or you know, all these combinations uh, of different ways of doing the five elements, which made sense to me because, you know, you never know what angle the guy's going to attack you at. You never know, you know. So if you practice the various footworks, 
forward, backward, side to side, you know, all these different angles that you can execute the five elements at, it, it you know, to me, it makes sense that uh, you'd have uh, a way to apply those five techniques in a variety of situations, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I've heard it said that if you if you really know one of the elements, then you you know them all. Mm. If you if you truly know it, did did he categorize this stuff in any way? Did he ever write any of these things down? Did... I don't think so. You know, um, he would just you know show us right. stuff and answer our questions. You know, and we just follow him. You know, like like you do. You know. Again, we were fortunate that we were writing articles and they would sit and answer all our questions, but that's typically not what's done in, in the old school way. I mean, the old school way, the teacher just goes out and does it and you follow. There's not a lot of talk. You know, you just, you got like Vince Black used to say, you've got to steal it. Right. Yeah. Clever like a fox. You you can't, they're not going to hand it to you. Right. You got to, you got to take it. And so, um, Again, that's why we were fortunate to be able to ask the questions uh, because that wasn't a, a typical thing. And what we decided when we went to, especially mainland China, is we needed to talk to guys that had gotten good at martial arts prior to 1949. Right. Because when the communists took over, it, everything changed, of course. Right. And so we had to talk to guys that were, you know, had put in their time prior to 1949. So everybody we talked to uh, was born prior to 1920. You yeah. know, I think the oldest guy we interviewed was uh, uh, Liao, the monkey boxer in Taiwan. He was 95. Um, and then Li Ziming was, was uh, 91 when I interviewed him. He was born in 1900. And then uh, same with Gong Bao Zai in uh, um in Taiwan, he was 90, 91, you know, and everybody was in, everybody we interviewed pretty much was in their 70s or 80s or 90s. So we were after that era of, of guys. What was Lisa Ming like when you interviewed him? Um, he was a super nice guy and, and was really um, open to answer all my questions. <clears throat> and I, I had a copy of the Bagua Journal with me and I showed it to him <clears throat> and he had a pair of glasses on. Yeah. And he looked at it and he grabbed another pair of glasses and put them over top of those glasses so he could look. And of course, in the Bagua Journal, I had like the early Bagua Journals had a little, uh, at the end of each article, I had a little table that had the Chinese names uh, in Chinese. And so he just looked at that list of, of guys that we were talking about. Uh, and he's like, oh, I know these, I know these guys, <laughs> you know? Yeah, he, he was really nice. And of course he, uh, he asked me, uh, he handed me a book that he had done in Chinese and, and asked if I would um, publish that in English. Because, um, you know, I had a publishing company and he, he said his dream was to have his book published in English. So I told him I would look into it, you know, and he uh, at that meeting, Zhao Dayuan, who was one of his students, was there. And he said, if you need any help, Zhao, Zhao will help you. And so when I got back um, and met Vince Black, I told Vince, you know, I, Vince had studied with Li Ziming. He'd spent a lot of time with Li Ziming. And I told Vince that Li, Li Ziming had asked me to publish this book. He said, oh, he asked me the same thing and I've already had it translated, right? And he sat with Li Ziming for hours going over each chapter in each one of the poems and songs. And, you know, so he had all, all the legwork done. So that's, you know, Vince and I got together and, and put that book out. And that was the first book that I did, uh, you know, as a publisher, as a book publisher. Amazing. So what what eventually led for the, the decision to stop with the Bagua Zhang Journal? Was it just that you'd um, it reached its course or was there something else that you were moving into? Oh, a lot of things happened. Um, probably the biggest thing was the birth of my daughter. Uh, I, I did not want to, uh, she was born in 1996, uh, Jan, uh, January 3rd, 1996. I didn't want to be gone to China, to China for a couple months a year with the, the baby at home. You know, yeah. I didn't want to do all the traveling I had been doing uh, and, and having a young kid was the first thing. 
And the other thing was, uh, you know, I felt like uh, I I kind of maybe run its course, you know, um, at the time, that's what I thought, you know, I would interviewed a lot of guys and I was like, how many, how many different ways can we talk about yin style, chung style or liang style or whatever, you know, I, I, I'd, I'd interviewed most of the prominent guys in the United States and, and, uh, kind of interviewed a lot of the, the guys that were still around in, in Taiwan and Hong Kong and Beijing. So that combined with, um, uh, you know, my daughter being born and, and also from my personal practice, you know, I'd spent all those years collecting so much information. I had, I had notebooks and notebooks full. I had, you know, hours and hours of videotape. I had, I, I, I record audio recorded every interview and I had all this information. And I thought, man, I just need to spend time and assimilate this stuff. I need, you know, I had it in my head, but not in my body. Yeah. I, I was writing about it. I was interviewing about it. I had a school, I was teaching it. I thought, man, I just need to, I just need to go inward for a while and spend time in process and assimilate all this stuff. So that's, you know, I stopped the Bagua journal. I stopped, I, I closed my martial arts school in 1998. Uh, I stopped the Bagua Journal in 1997. And uh, I started a, a guitar magazine, you know, after that. People probably know uh, I did that for 20 years. I did a guitar magazine. Now I'm, now, now I'm the managing editor of a bluegrass music magazine. Um, so, you know, I, I did my music. I raised my kids and I just practiced, you know. I, 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 uh, in 1998, I bought 10 acres of land in the mountains in Virginia. My closest neighbor was a mile away. I built a house and I just went on the mountain and practiced every day instead of worrying about writing about it or, yeah. you know, I, I, I just, I thought, you know, head knowledge and, and body knowledge is, is two wildly different things. Really? You know? Uh, diff way different understanding. You got to get the stuff in your body. You got to contemplate it and understand it on a deeper level. And that's, that's what I tried to do for, you know, like 15 years. I didn't teach anybody. And I just practiced uh, the stuff I had learned and, you know, read through the notes and watched the videos and just tried to, you know, <clears throat> assimilate it all. So, yeah, that's, uh, I mean, I did a little things here and there. Leon Kachun came over uh, several times to the United States. Vince Black brought him over a couple of times and I would, I would travel with him and see him. And, you know, we also, we brought over uh, Lola Desho, you know, and I would go on workshop tours with Park Bucknam. And, and uh, uh, I had at my school in California, you know, I had a lot of people come through. Leon Kachun came and Lola Show came and Tim Cartmel and Bill Tucker and all these guys, you know, friends of mine, Vince Black, came a lot uh and you know i was involved in vince's organization and 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 um all that i really uh admired vince as a as a martial artist as a fighter as a as a uh, medical practitioner and as a teacher i mean he was a brilliant guy and very very good at what he did both martially and as a, a chinese medicine doctor so i spent a lot of time with vince in that time period that you spent um, focusing on your own studies, did you, I know you're trying to get away from the writing and taking notes, but did you have a lot of um, personal development that you sort of like took note of or, or journaled about or anything of that nature? Did you chronicle it in any way, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Um, in about uh, 1992, I started writing a novel that I'm still working on and there's an old Chinese man character and that's kind of an amalgamation of all the characters I met you know and so uh you know I I'm still working on that thing and that's kind of my uh chronicling you know I'll this this old Chinese guy this young guy that just graduated high school meets this old Chinese guy and you know I, I also have an old hillbilly guy that's an amalgamation of all the old bluegrass hillbillies that I've interviewed all over the years. And so I just kind of put my thoughts down in, in, in that thing. I don't know if I'll ever put it out or, or ever, 
need to put it out. It's just my, it, that's just, that's my journaling, basically. How would this old guy teach this young kid, yeah. you know? And so, you know, I write different chapters about different things and, you know, all kinds of things from, uh, you know, meditation practices to Qigong to martial arts. And, you know, you know, I probably have 300 pages written and it, it, that's kind of, like I said, I'll probably never put it out. Just kind of like my journal is yeah. imagining how this old guy would teach this young kid. You know? <laughs> it would be interesting to read. I am, um, you know, it's, it's interesting to me that you, uh, that you're involved the way that you are in bluegrass, because I grew up in Eastern Kentucky and mm -hmm. uh, I see a lot of parallels between um, those sort of traditional arts like bluegrass and mountain style of living and things like that, almost dying out. And then sort of, you know, you had a little revival back in the 60s and 70s with sure. fire books and things like that. And then the same thing with, you know, the Chinese traditional arts, you know, right. they, they come to this brink of extinction and then there's a revival and then they slide back towards the brink. And it's like every so often there has to be somebody to come along and, you know, write this stuff down and learn this stuff and try to pass it yeah, on. There's a, usually a book or a movie or something that yeah. brings it back, up, you know. And then you you know you can follow the sort of trajectory of the the I, I want to say fad martial arts, but just the 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 popular thing you know in this in the fifties and sixties it was judo and then karate came in and then kung fu during the seventies because of the kung fu TV show and then you know and then it went into um, the uh, Brazilian jiu jitsu and mixed martial arts you know these things sort of you know, run their course of popularity. Um, and, you know, ho hopefully they'll, they come back around and, and they survive, you know. Do you think that there's necessarily like a decline every time that happens in the quality of the practice or the art, or do you think that that's just sort of the natural um, way of things that, you know, things uh, a new generation gets interested in and it's just their own interpretation on it? Unfortunately, I think uh, most anything of really great quality declines over time in our culture. I agree. Because um, people want everything to be fast and easy and immediate and uh, things of great quality are never that way. People... Um, you know, aren't willing to spend the time it takes, you know, and there are exceptions, of course, you know, there are some young bluegrass players right now that are phenomenal, you know, so it it's not that it doesn't happen. Uh, but I think, you know, it does, you know, be just because of our culture and our society and the fast paced and all the different just distractions that people have uh, you know, when I was a kid, you had three TV channels and there's nothing to do but be outside and do and do physical activity. Now, I, you know, kids these days, man, they got so many choices and so many distractions that uh, I just think it's hard to really focus and, 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 and have the patience. Uh, people have just younger kids, especially, I think, have short, really short attention spans, you know. Um, so to, 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 to tell somebody, you know, stand in Santi for, for a year, you know, there's no way, you know, yeah. but you know, the older I get and I, you know, when I, when I was started 40 years ago, I just wanted to learn as much as I could also, right. you know? Yeah. But now looking back, I'm like, you know, if I had to spend a year doing Santi instead of learning all that, all that stuff, I'd be much better now, I think, you know? there's 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 value and wisdom in the way it was taught in the old days but you're not going to get people to stay interested long enough to do it that way anymore i you know well that segues nicely into my next question so what, what do you think the future of internal martial arts is given that we live in the society that we live in does it have a future well like you said i think things come around again you know, and I think that, um, you know, I, I run a farm here in Missouri and, you know, I get a lot of these uh, uh, emails and newsletters and magazines about farming and, and uh, 
I mean, you know, like this country went way into this big agriculture, corn, soybean, you know, right. And it's, that's still around, but now there's this grassroots movement to go back to homesteading and small farms and people growing their own things organically. And so I think things of great quality like that, there, there, there's always going to be pockets of people that are seeking that out. And so I don't think internal martial arts were ever meant for the masses, you know, uh, I think if internal martial arts did become popular, it would destroy them, you know, uh, because anything that becomes real popular, it, you know, it, it goes down to the lowest common denominator sometimes, you know, these, these arts were not really, I don't think meant to be popular. You have to be called, you have to have a certain calling to have the patience and the, the determination to do these things. And so it's always going to be a, a smaller segment of the population. And the size of that small segment, I think, will change ebb and flow like everything else, you know. And so, um, you know, right now I have a pretty good group of students, you know. Um, uh, my 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 more hardcore students, I mean, I, I teach uh, for the Parks and Rec. I teach Taiji for Parks and Rec and everybody. I got a lot of people in those classes, but it's all older people that just want some exercise to do. They have no interest in martial applications, no real interest in deep exploration of meditation or those kind of things. Uh, and that's fine, well, and good because it, you know, it can serve that purpose. But I, you know, I have right now a pretty good group of maybe 15 to 18 people that I teach on Saturdays for a couple hours that are more seriously interested in the applications, more ser seriously interested in all the internal aspect aspects of, of the art, not just not just the fighting. Uh, so, yeah, I think uh, it'll continue, but it's never going to be popular. It's never going to make people a lot of money. And it shouldn't. You know, right. Vince Black always told me internal martial arts is not a business yeah. right when i started my school in california you know i had rent to pay and i had advertising and i had electric bills and all that and so i found this little book on you know running your martial arts school you know how to run a martial arts school and, and make money you know yeah. and i had that on my desk in my office and i said hey vince i was reading this book it's got some good ideas in there and he looked at me and said internal martial arts is not a business you know, yeah. and so I don't, I don't advertise. I don't, you know, I just, Vince's idea was if, if people uh, are meant to come to you, they will. Yeah. And the people that you have to talk into it are usually your problem children. Yeah. Okay. So why, why make that difficulty for yourself? You know, <laughs> right. You know, you don't, you, people that come to you because they want it are going to be the good students. People you have to convince or, or, or sell, sell it on. Yeah. yeah. I don't spend time selling it on people. If they want to do it, we can do it. But um, I don't need to convince them because, you know, it's just going to be problems. Right. I would agree. Dan, it's been great talking to you. I really appreciate you taking time out to talk yeah. to me. Is there is there anything that you would like to uh, promote or uh, tell people where they can find you at, like Bluegrass Unlimited, for instance? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, bluegrassunlimited.com. If people are into, into bluegrass music, that's that's where we're at. Um, th this magazine's been published uh, continually since 1966, so anybody that's in the bluegrass community probably knows about it, but. Um, I have a farm in Missouri, a uh, 10 acre farm, small 10 acre farm that I've sort of set up as a uh, retreat center. Awesome. And uh, once a month from March through November, we have a three day weekend retreat. Um, and I do music, guitar, mandolin, banjo, you know, uh, singing, songwriting. We have music retreats there and we also do martial arts retreats. And I, for the martial arts retreats, um, you know, some of them I do myself, but many of them I'll bring in my buddies. Tim Cartmel comes in, you know, uh, some of Vince Black's guys come come in, um, have come in to do stuff. And uh, not just the uh, 
martial arts, but also Chinese medicine stuff. You know, we have uh, uh, twenty now workshops and you know that kind of thing as well. And um, my email, the best email for me is editor at bluegrassunlimited.com. And for the for the retreats, I don't have a website or any of that kind of stuff. You know, I just kind of, like I said, I, if people find me, that's fine. If not, I'm not worried about it. You know, again, that's that's not my main source of income. So, you know, I, I don't want it to be because I don't want to have to rely on that. I think if you're relying, if a teacher's relying on that for their main source of income, that's another way it can become uh, watered down. Yeah. Because you're going to sacrifice the art to keep students, you know, yeah. um, and I I think that's detrimental to the art as well, is when teachers think, well, I'll modify a little bit because it'll be easier and I'll get more students, you know, right. that's not the way to go. So yeah. beside the point. <clears throat> anyway, and I have I have people that come in, uh, you know, and stay for a week or three days or whatever. Some of my old old students from my school in California still come come and uh, come in for three or four days or a week and, and train. And, you know, I've got one of my senior students actually lives at my farm. Um, and so he's there for people to practice with. And so, yeah, we just have just sort of a laid back kind of thing going. You know, I teach Taiji three days a week um, to gr big groups. You know, like I said, one, one's a corporate gig, you know, one of the corporations here in town, you know, people that are, that work for them that want to take a Taiji class once a week, we teach that. And then I got two days a week through Parks and Rec that I do for free. And then uh, on Saturdays, I have a, a regular two hour class for the more serious folks. But, you know, that's what, that's what I'm up to these days in, in terms of martial arts. And, uh, you know, also teach music. And I play music in several bands and, you know, I, I'm the editor of this bluegrass magazine. So I got all that going on, but I've always um, stayed connected to my own practice in, uh, in martial arts. And then I, uh, you know, I teach if people are interested in learning what I, what I have to teach, then, you know, I do that Qigong, Taiji, Shini, and Bagua. You've definitely got a lot to, uh, to teach, a lot to offer. I would say after after every place that you've been and all the people that you've spoken to and, and learned from. So, well, like I said, I, I I feel like I was very fortunate, you know, and um, I feel like uh, not only fortunate in the people that we interviewed, these older Chinese uh, people, but also in the friends that I made during that journey, you know, that were along with me, you know. It could have never happened without Tim Cartmel and Bill Tucker translating for me uh, overseas or Ken Fish translating for me during many phone calls. Because, uh, as you know, Ken's Chinese is very, very good. In fact, he would I, I would put him on the phone with somebody to, to do translate of an interview. And then he'd give the phone back to me. And the person that I was talking to would say, oh, where in China is your is your friend from yeah i said he's a white guy and they'd be like no way yeah you know because he, he 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 his you know his his chinese is so good and tim tim and bill tucker as well their chinese is is very very good and not only because their uh ability to speak chinese and english is, is at a high level but their knowledge of martial arts as well because you know I tried several translators that didn't know martial arts but knew Chinese and English very well, and it doesn't it doesn't work out yeah. well because the 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 lingo the Chin that martial arts lingo in Chinese they just didn't get. So yeah. that's why it was it was nice for me to have translators that um, knew martial arts internal martial arts very well because they they knew what the people were talking about. Yeah, it's like a language within the language for sure. Yeah, yeah, and you know, and Tim also studied classical Chinese and that's why he could translate some of those older books as well when he was in college he, he studied classical Chinese writing which is a different animal than modern writing right, right. so yeah yeah Tim is uh Tim and I have been friends for a long time like I said he comes here to Missouri to teach about once a year and we always have a great time and learn a lot you know he's he's very he's he's highly skilled and extremely knowledgeable about all that stuff 
Absolutely. Uh, you had a, a, a good group of people to work with for sure. Yeah. And, you know, and, and Vince Black and Tom Bizio, you know, those guys were phenomenal as well. And I don't know if you, you, if you know Tom, but man, he's not personally, but he has a, you know, I'm well aware of him, obviously, you know, he's w- widely, highly regarded. <clears throat> Yeah, Tom, uh, I think of all the people that ever studied with Vince, Tom, Tom's the top guy in, in medicine and martial arts. You know, Tom really knows what he's doing. Yeah, we hope to talk to him some point soon, too. So Yeah, cool. Yeah. Well, Dan, I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, thanks uh, for having me.